This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. It is my great pleasure to introduce to you today a man who really doesn't need any introduction, but I will do my best anyway. This is, of course, Dr. Gilles Bronsborg, who is our executive director here at the American Numismatic Society, although sadly for only about a month longer, because Gilles will be stepping down towards the end of September to take up a fellowship at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, where he will be working on a monograph. Um, most of you also are aware that Gilles is an accomplished scholar in numismatics of the late Roman period, particularly where he has published a great deal. But um, in addition to his publication, he also has a number of other um, scientific and ac uh, academic affiliations, including with the Institute for Advanced Study or Institute for the Study of the Ancient World at New York University. Um, he also um, has a number of associations with the National Scientific Research Center in France, that's the CNLS, um, including one at uh, Orléans, that's the University in Orléans, um, with the Archaeometry Research Center there. And he is also affiliated with the Centre des Etudes Byzantines, with the Collège de France, um, where he also uh, is an associate member there as well. So today he is going to be talking about one of his uh, specialties, which is of course, late Roman coinage. And we'll be discussing coins as tools of civil war from Diocletian to Constantine. So Gilles, turn it over to you. Thank you, Peter. Um, just uh, uh, one comment, Ben Alan. At the very end, I could barely hear what Peter was saying, so maybe increase a little bit. Yeah, thank you. So uh, we are going to deal with a specific uh, period of Roman numismatic history, and very precisely um, the the years three hundred five, uh, three twenty four. So why why this period? Um, it's a very critical period for Rome, and to a wider extent, uh, I should almost say for our civilization, because this is when the Roman Empire transitioned from uh, being um, you know, pagan or polytheist into a Christian empire, since Constantine would be the first emperor to convert uh, to um, Christianity. Um, at the same time, it's an ex extremely interesting period because as most of you know, in the third century, the Roman Empire almost disappeared. Um, invasion, civil wars took place, and um, the Roman state could have entirely uh, vanished from history at that point. But thanks to a range of extremely dynamic emperors like Aurelian um, and later on Diocletian, all of them from Illyrian origins, uh, so former Yugoslavia, um, the, the emperor was restored to its initial glory um, and a new organization um, was set up both from a political standpoint and a numismatic standpoint. What Diocletian figured out was the, the, the empire is too large, too big, can't be ruled by one emperor. Uh, the threats at the border uh, are worse than they used to be in the first or second century, so you need more than one emperor. So the occasion idea was to create a collegial rule with two senior emperors, the Augusti, and two junior emperors, the, the Caesars. Um, we call it tetrarchy, but the, they didn't call it tetrarchy. Tetrarchy was coined in the late 19th century by German scholarship. Um, the, uh, it, it refers to the tetrarch of, of, of Judea uh, in the first century, but this is very different. We, it, it, obviously, we're talking about four rulers, uh, two Augusti, two, two, two Caesari, um, but they did not call themselves tetrarch. It's something we use uh, in, uh, in modern scholarship. So in 284, Diocletian um, put in place a, a, a colleague, Maximianus. Both of them are Augusti. They hire uh, two junior um, uh, emperors. Um, Galerius and Constantius, 
And the process is ideally every 15 years, um, the senior emperors will resign, retire, enjoy retirement life, won't be killed like their predecessors, and the junior emperors will become senior emperors and will appoint new junior em uh, emperors and so forth. This way, uh, you divide the empire in four, uh, between four um, responsible rulers, and at the same time, you avoid giving power to your children, because why would your children be good enough? By selecting someone else, um, the, the theory was that more, um, uh, more worthy rulers would be selected instead of the son. I mean, think about Commodus and Marcus Aurelius, or, or maybe Caracalla and Septimius Severus. There are plenty of examples of uh, immediate sons who did not quite match their parents' expectations or father's expectations. Um, so I'm going to share a map now. Um, OK, share. So this is a, a quick um, chronological outline. Um, Diocletian becomes uh, Augustus. His last competitor, Carinus, is killed. In 286, Maximianus becomes, uh, I said 284, that was a mistake. Maximianus becomes co-Augustus. And then in 293, the first uh, Tetrarchy. Um, in 305, under pressure from uh, Diocletian, Maximianus and Diocletian um, retire. Constantius and Galerius becomes senior emperor. And Severus and Maximinus become Caesari. In 306, things become more complicated. Constantius dies early, and his son proclaims himself Augustus. At the same time, Maxentius, Maximianus' son, thinks as well that he deserves to become emperor. So he usurps the throne in, in Rome. Um, so things become complicated, and um, from the ideal map with four rulers, we're moving into a more complicated, I, I tried to resume everything on that spreadsheet, but as you can see, it, it becomes confused, especially between 306 and, and 312. At some point, there are six people who believe they should be emperors, including um, uh, someone uh, in, um, in North Africa for a little while. So, Max, and, and Maximianus, who is not happy to retire, uh, tries to get back um, uh, as emperor. And to make, to make matters more complicated, there are some uh, matrimonial alliances taking place. So Fausta, Maximianus, so the senior Augustus, uh, who, who had retired, uh, Fausta will uh, marry Constantine, who, sh who should not be emperor because he, he was the son of Constantius, but was not nominated as emperor. And um, Fausta happens to be Maxentius' sister at the same time, knowing that Constantine and Maxentius will finally uh, fight and Maxentius will be killed um, in, three, in 312. Uh, so you're getting family matters that complicate the entire um, uh, picture. So if we summarize with a map, um, we're seeing Constantine, who controls Gaul, Iberia, and um, Britain. Uh, Maxentius controls Italy and, at some point, uh, North Africa, because there is some um, uh, local revolt uh, for, during a couple of years. Um, and in the east, we think Galerius and Severus. So Severus tries to take over Italy. He fails, he's killed. Um, then Galerius will try as well. He will fail, but won't be killed. Um, so we think in the east, um, Galerius and later on Maximinus Dia, and in the west, essentially Maxentius, Constantine, um, and Licinius will, uh, will appear as well at some point. Um, he was supposed to take over Italy, but didn't do it. And finally, Licinius will end as Constantine colleague after 312, when the empire is again uh, divided into 
in two halves of the west and the east. So it's a little, a little bit of a complicated map. Um, so moving to the currency, what, what makes the coinage of a period very, very interesting is that during most of the Roman imperial history, um, a coin would bear the name of the emperor or the name of someone very, very close to him, like his wife, his mother, uh, or his divinized father, or his son or sons. But it's um, the, the, the name of the people on the coins um, belong to a very, the very inner circle around uh, the living emperor. Moving into the Tetrarchy, Diocletian wishes uh, to establish four rulers. So, and, and at the same time, we have multiple means. In the past, in the, during the High Empire, the imperial means was essentially Lyon and Rome. I am not dealing with the provincial coinage, but the imperial means were essentially Rome and Lyon. And in the East, the uh, silver provincial coinage was minted out of Alexandria, Antioch, and a couple of other places, including uh, Pergamon or Ephesus. But the Latin-speaking coinage was 95% Roman Lugdunum, or Lyon. Uh, during the period of civil war, some other means appeared, but for a short while. During the Tetrarchy, it's a very, very different map because we're dealing with about 10 to 15 means which are spread across the empire uh, close to the armies. And this is uh, an, you know, an inheritance from the third century where moving means and moving emperors and moving armies needed to be close to the means. So result is like, you know, Trev and uh, Londinium, um, later Arelate, um, Achilleia, Carthage, Siscia, um, Sirmium, Nicomedia, Sisychus, Antioch, you know, name it. Um, it's a, we have a complete map of means in, you know, in Europe, in the Danubian area, in the Near East, and in North Africa, in Alexandria and Carthage. So the coins will bear the name of the mint. Uh, they will be usually a symbol for the officina inside a mint, because in one mint there may be more than one officina uh, producing coins. But the, the, the most interesting part is that each emperor will strike on behalf of the others. So let's say Diocletian controls Nicomedia. Uh, the mint of Nicomedia will strike in honor of Constantius and um, Maximinian and Galerius. So they are colleagues, and they're supposed to be, um, uh, let's say, friendly to each other. During our period, after 305 and Diocletian retirement, it becomes very interesting, because with the unraveling of a tetrarchy and the appearance of usurpers, the names on the coins don't become random anymore. Um, they will they will betray the alliances between these people. So if Maxentius strikes coins with the name of Constantine, that's because he's, he would like Constantine to be his ally. Um, if at the same time Galerius never strikes for Maxentius, that's because uh, Galerius does not recognize Maxentius as a legitimate ruler. So the legend on these coins tell us a lot about politics, and that's something new. That's not something we could see on uh, first, second, and third century coins. So I'm going to stop sharing and move to um, the camera. So um, how do, uh, Alan, how do I go back to, to the camera now? I do this. This, is it good? We can see the coin. Yes. Okay, good. So a quick summary. Um, this is a denarius uh, from Caracalla. Uh, so classic denarius with about 45% silver. The rest is bronze uh, or copper. And the, the corrosion on the coin uh, shows 
what we're talking about. The next coin I'd like to show now is what we call the Antoninianus. Even though it was not called Antoninianus at that, during that period, we call it Antoninianus because of the full name of Caracalla, who is the uh, inventor of that denomination. It's a double denarius. During the third century, with the economic and political crisis, the Antoninianus is debased. And I'm showing here um, yeah, a typically very debased Antoninianus from Claudius Gothicus. So this piece of crap, if you allow me to call it this way, um, has no more silver even as trace element. It's purely um, a two to three gram uh, copper coin, which is the, we are in, two, in 268, 269. Um, Caracalla was around 215 to 20. Uh, so in a matter of 50 years, it materializes the, the extent of the political and economic crisis sustained by the empire during the third century. Okay, so then come Aurelian, comes Aurelian. So with Aurelian, okay. Aurelian restores the empire uh, re and reunifies the empire by reincorporating the east that was controlled by Palmyra and the west with a Gallic empire and his coinage we call aurelianus because of his name again they did not call it this way at that time but that's how we call it uh, is a restored coinage with about five percent silver and a much better care in execution uh, so we witness uh, a political and economic re uh, imperial restoration Moving into the Tetrarchy now, um, so we jump about 20 years. And this one is a coin minted in Rome in 298 to 99, showing uh, Diocletian. So this is what we call the first Tetrarchy with Diocletian and Maximianus, uh, senior emperor. We we witness the restoration of, a, of, of the, a kind of Augustan, Augustus type of coinage system with gold, silver, billion, and copper. Let's say that the billion replaces the Cestercius in the denomination system, but it's pretty much inspired by the Augustan system. It's, it's very much about um, full imperial restoration. So this is gold. The next one is silver. At least we know how this coin was called because in a currency edict dated September 1st, 301, we have the name of that coin. It's an Argenteus. Once in a while, we know how these coins were called. So again, this is Diocletian. Again, it's Rome, 294. Uh, but I'm, now I'm showing another Argenteus from Rome, same year, this time showing Maximianus. As I was saying before, each emperor is supposed to pay some respect to his colleagues, even though it's the same mint. Still from Rome, this one bears the head of Constantius, so Constantius being uh, Constantine, father, and uh, his power basis was Britain. So this is Constantius, and uh, that's uh, the mint of Rome as well, 294, same year, and still the same year, we have here Galerius, the second junior uh, emperor, who is a Caesar, Galerius. So, um, what I could do uh, is maybe show the four coins next to one another. 
and reduce the scale. So let's see if I'm able to do that. And uh, reduce again. Oh, I can't reduce more, so I need to actually maybe change. Yes. So here we have the four colleagues. This is the full tetrarchy on, um, on the silver coins. Now uh, we're moving to the base coinage. So another one. This is what numismatists used to call a folis in the past. Uh, we know that the, the correct name is Numus. Um, that's a coin that was worth 12 and a half denarii before 301 and then 25 denarii after the September 1st 301 reform. So this one uh, shows Diocletian was minted in Rome um, in 298 um, and it incorporates about 3 to 4 percent silver. It's not entirely copper. Now, the next one I'm, I'm showing is a radiate, radiate coin. So you look at the, at the crown. And, and the radiate crown uh, coin is the descendant of the, or what we call the Aurelianus. Um, but in the new currency system, it's a fraction of a previous one. And uh, probably worth two and then four denarii uh, after the reform. So it's a fraction of uh, the one I was showing before. And if I show them on the same scale, um, you're seeing the difference in size. So this one, 12 and a half denarii, this one, two denarii, and then 25 and four denarii, most likely. I'm saying most likely because the, the 301 um, edict is fragmentary, was found in, a, in aphrodisias, and we still find new fragments from time to time. Um, so, uh, I will uh, go back now to the slides, so am I able to do this? Yes, I, I was well trained by, uh, by Alan. Thank you, Alan. <laughs> so this is the currency edict of 301 with a denomination, denomination change. Now let's talk about uh, the messy years, uh, three, so 306, uh, three, 312. As I was saying before, um, Maxentius and Constantine, well, Const first of all, Constantius died, and Constantine refused not to become uh, emperor, so he proclaimed himself Augustus. And Maxentius, who happened to be in Rome, so his father was still alive, Maximianus, Maxentius was in Rome and he thought, oh, if Constantine um, has become emperor, why not me? And he uh, took power in Rome, but being, made, I, I won't say modest, but maybe being uh, cautious, he didn't, call him, he didn't call himself Augustus or Caesar, he called himself Princeps, which is a kind of unicum. Uh, in the history of that period. There are no other princeps uh, around these, uh, you know, the fourth century or before or later. It's a very unusual title, which shows how Maxentius is um, a cautious diplomat. He is, he's, he's grabbing power, but step by step, thinking maybe they will accept me. He's already Constantine in, in London and, and Gaul with this Augustus title. So maybe me being princeps, my, my colleagues in the East will uh, accept the fait accompli. Um, so as we move on, so this is 306, and actually it's a very rare coin, and we don't have any of those in the collection. There are very few of these uh, princeps uh, series. So moving to 306, he gets promoted by himself, you know, never better served than by, by oneself and becomes a Kaiser, Maxentius, uh, Nobilis Kaisaris, and uh, Nobilus Kaiser, sorry, 
And um, in 307, Pius Felix Augustus, he promotes himself, Augustus. And this one is from Carthage. If we're looking at the NS trays, um, the transition is very visible. On the lower part of my screen, this is 305. So this is the end of a normal tetrarchy. And the coins are minted uh, on behalf of Constantius I, so is Constantine father, not dead yet, uh, Maximinus, who is the new Caesar in the East. Um, and we think, obviously, Diocletian, who is no longer emperor, he retired, but they still mean coin in honor of the retired uh, senior Augustus. And we think Severus as well on, um, on the lower right, who is one of the new Caesarii as well. Now, Maxentius uh, becomes uh, the, the, the ruler in Rome. And this is in 306. And if you're looking at 306, 307, what is Maxentius doing? He's striking for Constantine, for himself, and for Maximian. So he honors his father, he honors his brother-in-law, because Constantine will soon marry um, Fausta, uh, and he honors himself, obviously. So he, he's trying to build an alliance. Obviously, he doesn't, he doesn't strike for um, Maximianus, Severus, or Galerius, because these guys don't recognize him. So the names on the coins tell us who is with whom or against whom. Um, these trays Achilleia in northeast Italy, and we see the same transition. So the lower part of my screen, the first four lines at the bottom of the 305, 306 period. Then we move into, no, sorry, the first three. Then we move into the 306, 307, and it's very different. Um, Severus disappears, Maximinus disappears, and we see Constantine, uh, Maxentius, uh, Maximian, um, as in Rome. So this one is um, an example of uh, Maxentius uh, um, trying to buy uh, Constantine uh, as an ally. So he strikes for he strikes for Constantine, but very interestingly. Um, he puts Constantine as a Caesar. Um, I'll, I'll show some coins later on. But Constantine's title was sometimes Augustus, sometimes uh, Caesar, based on the negotiation um, Constantine uh, had to conduct with the other emperors uh, in the East. So it's interesting here that uh, Maxentius provides him with a lesser title. In this case, uh, Maxentius strikes gold, and the metal does matter. Um, if you want to pay respect to someone, striking gold is much more significant than striking uh, uh, bronze or bilan. So seeing Maxentius offering Constantine um, a, monnaieage, um, a monnaieage of gold uh, shows a great honor. So it's not just the title on the coin, but the type of coin as well. So in this case, in 307, Maxentius provides uh, the full Augustus title to Constantinus. And it's from the Mint of Rome in 307. And obviously to his, to his father, uh, Imperator Maximianus, uh, Senior Augustus. Maxentius does try to reach out to Maximinus, who is in the east. So Maximinus controls Egypt and Syria. And by reaching out to Maximinus, Maxentius' hopes would be to squeeze Severus and Galerius between himself and Maximinus. But Maximinus will not reciprocate. So we see here a diplomatic failure. He did not 
lead anywhere. Um, we see here another coin from Maxentius, um, from Ticinum, where he honors um, Constantius and uh, Constantine's father. Again, it's good politics to honor your friend's dad. Um, the relationship between Maxentius Constantine and Maximianus will become complicated because Maximianus never accepted his retirement. His retirement had been enforced by uh, Diocletian. So at some point, he tries to engineer a coup d'etat against Constantine. Don't forget, he married his daughter to Constantine. So Constantine is his uh, uh, son-in-law. So Constantine will force Maximianus to commit suicide. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of nice things in this family. Uh, but looks like Fausta will not be too upset because she remains a uh, Constantine wife, even though he had her father uh, killed. Um, so Maxentius will honor his dead father post-mortem, um, using the veal uh, on top of uh, Maximianus' head um, and the Deus title, which shows that he's a, he's a dead person at that time. So Constantine does reciprocate to Maximianus, uh, for example, from Lyon, a coin uh, for Maximianus Pius Felix Augustus. And these are some uh, scans from RIC Volume 6 uh, showing the, how the emperors honor uh, each other. So this one is from Lyon, and um, we seeing the normal tetrarchy at the beginning, Constantius, Galerius, Severus, uh, Maximinus, Constantine, but later on, uh, Constantine stops minting for um, Galerius and Severus, which shows as well some strained relationship between, between them. Uh, so now that's Rome, and Maxentius strikes for Maximianus um, and Constantinus, and obviously himself. Still, the, um, the coinage of Maxence, um, this is a book I highly recommend for anyone with an interest of the period, uh, by uh, Vincent Dros, who is now the Roman curator at the Bibliothèque Nationale. And we see here something very interesting. In, in the same year, if you look at phase, phase two here, the same year, um, the um, mint of Rome under Maxentius control means for, Constanz, for Constantinus both as Caesar and Augustus, as if he, he had not totally made up his mind whether or not he should provide his colleague with the most uh, senior title. So we see here some reciprocity to Maxentius from Constantine, the more cautious. There are much fewer types minted for Maxentius by Constantine. Constantine tries to keep his option open. He knows that if he sides with Maxentius, he will alienate everyone, everyone else in the East, Galerius, uh, Maximianus, Severus, and later on Licinius. So Constantine does pay lip respect to his brother-in-law, uh, but not too much. Uh, based on the number of types, it's very clear that Maxentius was the one proactively seeking alliance more than Constantine was. So this is an example here of um, a coin uh, minted uh, by Constantine for uh, Maxentius. This shows in our own trays. So this is here um, a tray of Lyon. And in green, um, we are seeing uh, the coins minted in honor of Maximianus um, by Constantine. But interestingly, we don't have a single Maxentius here. So assuming the number of coins that survived, 
have some relationship with the number of coins that were minted originally, um, the message is pretty clear. Constantine is indeed cautious not to uh, show Maxentius' name on his coins too often. It was a do Maximianus, who is Maxentius' dad. So in a way, it's an indirect um, act of friendship, but not direct. Um, now we're moving into the years uh, 311, 312, so right before the final war between uh, Constantine and Maxentius, Maxentius becomes diplomatically to totally isolated and is only minting for himself or his deceased son. He, he had a son, Romulus, who you seeing the Deus Romulus coins on the lower left hand side of the, of the screen. Um, Maxentius does not strike anymore for anyone else which is um, proof of his diplomatic uh, isolation um, at that point. And here, uh, this comes from Orker, the online con of the Roman Empire. We're seeing the, the authorities, Constantine, Galerius, Maximianus, and Licinius, and for whom they strike. And uh, um, Constantine does strike a little bit for Galerius, and uh, Licinius, but very little. Well, actually, Licinius, yes, but after 312. Uh, but for, for instance, he doesn't strike for Severus, um, and Galerius is extremely limited. So it shows us that Constantine is an extremely astute diplomat in the way he handled his relationship with the, comp the competing emperors. During the same period, the East ignores the West for the most part. So obviously, Galerius and Severus want to get rid of Maxentius, so they're not going to strike for him. Um, but they, they're very cautious about Constantine as well. Um, and in that entire tray from Antioch, uh, from, uh, from the year 310, uh, 3, uh, 3, uh, 3, sorry, 310, 312, there's a single coin from Constantine. Um, even though Constantine takes over Italy and gets rid of Maxentius in 312. So it shows how the Eastern rulers are, um, they don't want to get involved um, too much with what's happening in the West, and they ignore them, they ignore the Western rulers. Um, at the same time, they, pay res they, they do pay respect to um, Maximianus, the uh, the elder uh, emperor so it's not random we're dealing with decisions here uh, the mint the mint receive instructions about whom to honor this is diplomacy it's real diplomacy it's not random at all so here are some examples from thessalonica uh, under the management of galerius and, and licinius and they mint for their caesar maximinus and to some extent for Constantine, but as you see, um, they are, um, it's limited. They pay lip service to Constantine during uh, that period. So I'm going to show some uh, genuine coins now. Um, so back to our little camera. So this one, is an Argentius minted by uh, Maxentius for Constantine. Uh, well, for Constantine. <laughs> the next one, the next two ones are very interesting because one is from 306 and the other one from 307. They are billion coins, so the, the base coinage. And one of them calls the, the earlier one calls Constantine Kaiser, but the next one call him uh, Augustus. So Kaiser is visible here, and Augustus uh, is visible here on the right hand side uh, of the coin. So obviously, Maxentius is uh, providing high honors to Constantine between 306 and 307. So th the next coin, from Rome, so Maxentius honoring his father, Mac, uh, Maximianus. Uh, 
then we're moving to Carthage. So the next two coins I will show are Carthage before Maxentius takes control of Carthage. So during that period, Carthage follows the normal uh, tetrarchic um, system. Uh, let's turn the upside down. Okay, that would be better like this. And we see here uh, Galerius and Severus. So the legitimate um, Augusti and uh, Caesar. Uh, Severus will die trying to wrestle Italy back from Maxentius. So as soon as, and uh, well, yeah, and, sorry, and we think uh, one more coin, we think Maximinus, so the Caesar of the East, still from Carthage uh, in 305, 306, so before Maxentius takes control. So now Maxentius take over Africa, and we have here a coin from 307 of Maxentius himself. And the coins for Galerius and, uh, and the others are no longer minted in Carthage. The next one from Carthage is a Constantine noble Caesar from uh, 307. So very interestingly, it's the same year as the con from Rome, and we're showing where Constantine was Augustus. So in, in the same year, you're seeing different means under Maxentius control, providing Constantine with a different title. The next one, Honus Maximianus, still from Carthage. So under Maxentius' control. And then we have this usurper, uh, Domitius Alexander, who briefly revolts in Africa and takes control of North Africa. Obviously, Maxentius could not tolerate this since uh, the supply of Rome relied on uh, African grain. Um, so Maxentius will send troops, and um, this uh, usurper, Domitius Alexander, will be killed and expelled from Africa. So, moving to Lyon, Lugdunum. So now we are under Constantine control. This one, Honus Maximianus, is further in law. And Diocletian. And Maximinus as a Caesar. So again, it shows um, Const Constantine cautious diplomacy. He's trying to make sure that he has friends in the East in case. So this one is a Constantine by himself, Constantine, Constantine, with the title of Augustus from 309, 310. So, um, I have another coin which is interesting as well because it's from Thessalonica, from the East, and it's one of those coins minted for Constantine. So this is under Galerius' authority at that point. Again, Galerius will never mint with Maxentius' name, but he does, rarely, but he does for Constantine. So, um, the next co comment I'd like to show, I know we have about 15 minutes left, left, so I don't want to go beyond the hour. I'd like, I'd like to leave some time for the Q&A as well. 
Um, I'd like to show two more uh, aspects of that period. One is the devaluation process. Uh, since these emperors fight against one another, and I'm going to put some coins next to each other, they need to pay their armies. And in order to pay their armies, they need to debase their coins. Um, and it's a kind of competitive devaluation. Um, I'm, I'm using a modern term voluntarily because we think that four to six emperors paying their armies, fighting or lying against one another or against each other. Um, if you devalue your coins, but you don't change the pay, the military pay, you can pay more people with the same quality of metal. And it becomes a competitive process because the first one who devalues will benefit uh, compared to the others who will follow. And it's not surprising. So the first one was Constantine. And I'll show you a later Constantine next to this one. So the debasement is visible. Um, the first coin follows um, a 140th uh, of a gram uh, standard, and the, ne the next one is a one uh, 148th, and then it will become a 172nd. So, and I have one of them here, a later coin. Uh, no, sorry, not this one. Yeah, this one from 317, so it's about 10 years later. So you see here 10 years of monetary reform and progressive debasement of Constantine coinage. And very interestingly, the usurpers are the first one to initiate the debasement. So the debasement starts with in 307 with Constantine and Maxentius. And the emperors in the East stops, stop minting for like a year uh, until they adjust to the new standard. So they, they caught by surprise. Initially, they don't want to comply and devalue, but they have no choice. If, um, if you're dealing with coins which are debased, you cannot, um, you cannot keep high value coins at the same time because you know the Gresham's law will take place and the good quality coin will be uh, removed from the market by selective, uh, by, by selection, by, by the users. So after, so after 312, 3, 313, what happens? Maximinus dies and we end with, with two rulers. Um, so Maxentius was killed in 312, Maximinus dies in 313, and we end with Licinius and Constantine, and the empire is divided in two. Um, in 324, after a couple of wars between Licinius and Constantine, Constantine will become the third emperor um, and will reunify the empire. So the last thing I wanted to show uh, for that period, and moving into the 324 uh, uh, period, is the way Constantine goes back. So the Tetrarchy is over. We are in 324. Licinius has been killed, defeated and killed. Constantine is the sole ruler of the empire. He's made Christianity a legal religion. But actually, Licinius had agreed with that. I mean, Constantine was not the only one. It's not yet a state religion. It will become so um, with Theodosius. But it's, it has become a religio licita and the religion of the emperor. So it's like a privileged religion. Um, but what Constant, Constantine does, now that he has no more colleague uh, to deal with, so exit Maxentius, exit Licinius, um, exit uh, Maximinus Dia, Constantius goes back to the practice of honoring his immediate family. So what we see here, I'll show them with a box because the, the boxes display the name. So it's too big. Um, OK, 
Okay, I think I can't make it any smaller. Correct? Yeah. Oh, we, yeah, we can do this. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, yeah, that's better. Actually, if I could show six, the five coins at a time, that would be perfect. Yes, so here we're seeing um, Constantine family, or part of his family. Helena is his mother, Fausta his wife, Constantius one of his sons, Crispus another one, and Constantine the second another one. And I have somewhere a coin of his father, so Deus Constantius, and very interestingly, a coin for Deus Claudius. So who is this Claudius? It's Claudius Godicus, uh, who died in 270. And uh, the, Constantin, the Constantini dynasty claimed descent from Claudius. So Constantine tries to establish a dynasty by, um, with a claim into Claudius Godicus, who had died like 50 years or 55 years before, then honoring his mother, his wife, and his kids, uh, which is very, very different from a tetrarchic uh, period. Something that needs to be said about the uh, Constantine family is the coinage does not reflect, or actually, when a name goes, goes missing, it does reflect the actual family uh, dynamics. The story goes, there are different versions about it, that his son Crispus would have been involved with an adulterous relationship with his, with his wife, Fausta, so his mother-in-law, who was much younger than Constantine. So Constantine would have had his son executed, and then his mother, Elena, being very unhappy about losing her grandchild, um, Constantine put to death Fausta. Another story was that Crispus had been accused by Fausta of uh, willing to um, usurp the throne. Constantine would have listened to his wife, had Crispus killed, and then his wife killed. You can guess that both stories could be compatible. Maybe Fausta wanted to have some kind of personal relationship with Crispus, who refused. As a result, she told her husband, he's a bad guy, he wants your throne. So um, there are you know, uh, competing versions about what happened. The result is, that um, uh, Fausta and Crispus disappear. Um, Constantine's surviving sons from, his, uh, from Fausta, uh, he has three sons, Constantius II, Constantine II, and um, uh, Constance. The three of them we learn from their father, and the day Constantine died, most of the family will be murdered. Uh, uncles, um, cousins, nephews. So it's, um, it's a big massacre, um, the, the, year, the year of Constantine's death. So when I teach a class about that period, I always joke about the reason why Julian became an apostate and didn't have such a good uh, uh, perception of Christianity. He was one of the sole survivors of the family after his brother, uncle, grandfather, and so forth had been uh, assassinated. The last coin I will show now is one of the very rare coin um, of, of Constantine. That's part of the NS collection. So it's classically considered to be um, one of the first Christian impact on coinage because Constantine, instead of uh, you know, the, the, the classic profile uh, Roman coin, you look straight. But here, Constantine looks above. Um, as if looking at, at God. Uh, this is a double solidis, so um, what we call a medallion, a, pre a pretty rare coin from 327. Um, good, so I had plenty of slides I didn't display, but it's, um, it's eight minutes to two, and um, I think it would be fair to leave some time for um, questions, uh, so to have a, a dialogue, a Q&A session now. And maybe, Alan, you need to remind me, oh, oh uh, chat. 
Okay, I can look at the chat now. Hi, right, Jill, thank you very much. Um, and as Jill mentioned, we're certainly welcome some questions or comments if anybody has any. You can either type them into the chat or uh, just raise your hands and we will um, try to call on you. Uh, Austin, I see your hand is raised. Go ahead. Hey, um, you, you might have mentioned this and I missed it, um, but you said something about the son of Maxentius being on being shown on coinage. But did, did you mention his titles? Was he given any was he was he sort of assigned Caesar or anything on, yeah, he, on, on the coinage? Yeah, Ro Romulus was named uh, Caesar and then uh, Deus after his death. I I'm, I'm, I don't think he was given the title Augustus. I mean, the, this would be in this book, which is the the Bible on, on Maxentius. Um, looking at so, if I go to the mint of Rome, which is um, obviously the most significant mint, I don't think he was given uh, this um, Augustus title. So. Um, Yeah, I'm going through, so Maxentius, Constantinus, uh, Maximianus, Constantinus, um, and during the later phase of, of Rome, so I need to go uh, Aetana Memoria, Victoria, but these are reverse, um, reverse legend, um, Maxence, Romulus, so Romulus is Divo Romulo, um, Divo Romulo et, et Filio. No, he's not, no, he's not, he was not made um, an Augustus. And he died, he died early during the, the reign of Maxentius. Something which is very fascinating about Maxentius and I guess that's why Vincent wrote that monograph. Uh, Maxentius is um, very much the last emperor of Rome. He's the last emperor who will rule uh, from, from Rome. I'm seeing a very interesting question from, from Bob. Yes, so the, how about the Filius Augustorum? Um, so we are in 308, and there is, so it's a mess um, between the legitimate emperors and the non-legitimate emperors. And a conference is held in Carnuntum uh, involving the elder Diocletian, who um, leaves retirement to get involved. And they're trying to figure out a, a system where everything would be acceptable to everyone. And uh, Constantine is, um, is suggested with, first of all, they want to demote him as a Kaiser, but then the title of, um, of uh, son of Augustus, uh, so, fi uh, so fil Filius Augustorum, um, is suggested for Constantine, but Constantine doesn't want it. So um, these coins are minted under uh, Galerius, uh, control, but never by Constantine or Maxentius. So it's an attempt at compromise. They don't want to give the title Augustus to, to Constantine. The reason behind being because of uh, Galerius. Galerius wants to appoint his buddies. Licinius, Maximinus, and Severus are former military commanders under, um, under Galerius. So in a way, it's Galerius' stubbornness that prevent a peaceful settlement of the situation. I'm seeing more things on the chat. Um, yeah, no, I, th I think it's, uh, yeah, the Galeria, Valeria, there's a question about Galeria Valeria. 
I think it's it's part of um, you, you're perfectly right. It's part of this series of coins honoring Diocletian or Maximianus. So um, it's um, it's these kind of coins or series are very consensual, honoring a dead uh, or honoring uh, the daughter of a senior uh, Augustus is not uh, controversial, and they're trying to avoid. Um, uh, controversy, which is why uh, Galerius is very careful not to honor Constantine too often, but he will strike more often in favor of uncontroversial figures um, like the occasion Maximinus, um, Maximianus, and in that case, Galeria Valeria. Um, so I'm seeing David Vaghi. Constantine consciously portrayed himself without a beard. However, he usually, he usually is shown bearded, or at least with a, a light beard on coins issued at mint, controlled by other rulers. Do you know of exceptions? No, I've not looked into this. Um, uh, no, I don't know about this. So I, I, I won't make up an answer. I've not been looking into this. All right, do we have any other questions or comments? All right. Well, Regarding the beard, I mean, obviously. Oh, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry, uh, David. Uh, obviously, you're thinking about Julian. Uh, Julian the Apostate will, um, will be featured with a very prominent beard on his coinage. And in his case, it's a beard of a philosopher, uh, which is a way to. Um, affirm his paganism or anti-Christianism uh, once he becomes uh, emperor in uh, in 361. Um, but I've, I've not looked into the Constantine and beard issue, so I, I don't know if we can relate it to, to Julian. Uh, you know, there are like 30 years uh, between both, both cases, so I'm not sure about even meaning uh, was the same in, in the sweet 20s. All right. Um, we are at the top of the hour, and if there are no more questions or comments for Gilles, I'd like to thank him again for this wonderful and informative talk.